I know you're all very passionate, and it's wonderful to have so many people bubbling with ideas, with excitement and commitment, but we really have to also hear our panel discuss a very, very important issue. How are we going to lay a solid foundation for the next 15 years? How are we going to make sustainable development more successful than the Millennium Development Goals were? And they were more modest goals, and they achieved something quite extraordinary. They reduced by half the people on this planet living in extreme poverty. However, there's a lot of unfinished business to be taken care of, and all of that is going to be folded in the development goals for the next 15 years, and they will also take on climate change issues. So it's a huge agenda. And how do we start this agenda on the right foot? We started by building a solid foundation, and that is what we're going to discuss today with this panel, I'd like to introduce the chair of this panel who will lead this important discussion, Nitin Desai. He's a distinguished fellow of Terry and also a former UN Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs. Welcome. So we had a very interesting inaugural session. You, I think you've been given the background by the person who's introduced me, so I won't <coughs> take any more time. We are a little short, so we'll just move straight in. And we're going to begin first with a little video message from Prince Albert of Monaco. A video message. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, unfortunately, I was unable to join you today for this summit. Nonetheless, I was eager to send you this message of support and friendship. The Delhi Sustainable Development Summit is indeed an important event for the planet, for its future, and for the key issues of which this future is made. I believe this year's theme alone, Sustainable Development Goals and Dealing with Climate Change, accounts for the magnitude of the task which brings you together on a particularly urgent issue for which I also mobilize my efforts with my government and with my foundation. Confronted with such a challenge, both complex and global, the method that you have chosen based on knowledge sharing and open dialogue is, as far as I'm concerned, a model as well as a prerequisite for success. The joint presence of scientists, political leaders, intellectuals, and economic players allows for an informed and shared approach based on analyses and experiences, and is above all a guarantee of efficiency. I also believe that it is especially important that this initiative, emanating from the highly renowned Energy and Resources Institute, is being conducted in India, thus demonstrating the efforts of this great country in the global combat to preserve the planet. Beyond India itself, your action helps to prove that the concern for the environment is not, as some too often tend to make us believe, confined to a few countries in the north. On the contrary, we know that the threats hanging over the entire planet will spare no country, no continent, and that they will, as always, hit hardest those who are the most vulnerable. That is the reason why your initiative should reach as wide an audience as possible this year and in the future as it has been doing for the past 15 years. That is also why I'm keen to assure you of my loyal support and express my admiration for Rajendra Pachari both for his action as the head of the IPCC and Terry, as well as the Daily Sustainable Development Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you have the list of uh, the panel here and the uh, short bios of these. I'm not going to take up a lot of time introducing them. Let me begin first with the, the panel uh, discussion by requesting Mary Robinson, formerly president of Ireland, and also UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and now currently the UN uh, Secretary General Special Representative on Climate. Since she uh, left the UN, she has devoted a great deal of her time to issues of climate justice, and I'm sure we all look forward to what she has to tell us. Excellencies, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be back here in Delhi for this uh, Delhi Sustainable uh, 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 development uh, summit. Uh, I've come to India a number of times wearing different hats, but I remember one special occasion when I had the honor as president of Ireland to pay a state visit to this country in the mid-90s. And that was when I realized what a common history Ireland and India shared when we struggled for independence. The letters that Prime Minister Nehru wrote to President uh, de Valera of Ireland and the correspondence between them the fact that the Irish Constitution of 1937 
had quite an impact on the constitution, the later constitution of this country. Um, the fact that our flags look very similar, um, especially if the wind is blowing. I sometimes don't know whether it's the Indian flag or the Irish uh, flag. And uh, it's a reason why I've been very pleased to have this opportunity to come back in this very special year. And so far during this conference, I've been very impressed by the positive nature of all of the contributions. Somehow, there's a change of tone which is very welcome. We're all aware of what needs to be done, and we want, insofar as possible, uh, to work well together. So um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to listen to the views of everyone gathered here about how 2015 can be an unprecedented year. As others have said, if we get it right, this year can go down in history as a year when the international community summoned the moral leadership to transform the lives of billions of people today and in future generations. Because this is the year, as we've heard, when we can agree an effective way forward on two vital agendas, advancing sustainable development and winning the battle against climate change. And that's why I'm very pleased that the topic of this particular session is to look at the linkages between those two agendas. Of course, many people rightly say that they are, two, they are not two agendas, that there is no separation between them. No reasonable person would disagree with the proposition that sustainable development and climate change are mutually supportive and indeed interdependent. But if that's the case, why are we hearing so many voices from reasonable people who insist that the sustainable development agenda mustn't be mixed up with the climate change agenda? I'd like to spend the next few minutes offering some thoughts on the reasoning behind these voices because it poses a challenge to us all. If we dismiss these voices, then the task of bringing people together to support both the SDGs and a climate agreement will just become harder. On the other hand, if we work to understand them, we might bring the two agendas together and as a result, advance the objectives we all care about. To get there, I suggest that there are three basic arguments that we need to understand. The first argument is what I would call the hardened experience argument. Many people, especially from today's developing world, view the sustainable development agenda and its related financing for development process as a continuation of agreements about overseas development assistance or aid, whereby developed countries commit to the provision of aid for the alleviation of a poverty and the advance of human development. From a practical standpoint, they see the SDG agenda and financing for development process as a continuation of the Monterey commitment for developing countries to provide 0.7% of developed world GNI towards overseas development assistance with a particular focus on the world's poorest countries. They point out that this commitment long predates any commitment to climate finance and that there's a huge backlog of requirements for this aid in areas such as healthcare, education, and the development of strong and capable governance institutions. As a result, many developing countries are very alert to the possibility that the climate change agenda may result in aid money being siphoned away to pay for climate action. They also point out that the developed world, with a few honorable exceptions, has not come close to meeting its Monterey commitments. So, they argue that the financing for development process and the SDG agenda should keep focused on its original priorities and not add any new, often expensive requirements to an, ever, an already overloaded agenda. So that's the first argument. The second argument is what I would call the focus argument. Proponents of this perspective say that climate action is about a singular issue. It's about greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, we must focus both on shifting to a world of zero emissions and repairing the damage caused by the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere. They say that this requires a focused, meaningful, strong climate agreement where everyone, comes, get, uh, everyone carries their fair share of the burden to act and that we're blurring this very clear objective if we load extra complexity into the climate process by linking it with the SDG process. And the third argument is what I would call the managerial argument. It recognizes that whether it was right to do this, the climate and STD processes are different. Those working on one have a hard enough job to do without having to integrate with the other in the next few months. They're also working to different timelines with the SDGs kicking in from January 2016. 
and whatever is agreed within the climate agreement not kicking in until 2020. To put it at its most basic, country officials working on one process simply don't have the time to be fully aware of what's going on in the other process. So what are we going to do to really make good linkages? On the one hand, we have the inescapable logic that sustainable development and climate action are so totally interdependent that they have to be pro progr uh, progress together. On the other hand, there are real reasons why climate change requires the singular focus of the UNFCCC, why experience shows that developing countries are right to be alert to the possibility that ODA resources might get siphoned off to pay for climate action, and it is a fact that we already have global institutions that treat sustainable development and climate change separately. We have to bridge the divide between the different ways of thinking, and we need to bridge it fast, because the Addis meeting on financing for development is July, and we're already into February. So doing so is a priority for me, both in my role as UN Special Envoy um, for uh, clim Climate Change, and in my capacity as president of the Mary Robinson Foundation, Climate Justice. In major part, it's a priority because I worry that the context for the Paris meeting on climate change in December will be strongly influenced by progress on the SDGs, both at the Financing for Development meeting in Addis in July, and then at the UN meeting to adopt the SDGs in September. If those meetings go badly, then it will significantly impact on our chances of success in Paris. So we must bridge the gap before Addis. And in my view, this means three things, and I will say them very briefly. Firstly, we need those involved in the climate process and those involved in the SDG process to come to terms with the importance of each process to the other. As part of this, we need to work together to craft a clear, honest narrative around the logical synergies between the two agendas, but also around the practical challenges to these synergies, as I outlined a few minutes ago. Secondly, it's hard to overemphasize the importance of being honest about financing. As it relates to financing for development and the SDGs, we need to make it clear that climate action cannot be about raiding budgets expected to support other vital activities in the developing world and the steady progress of the developing world away from aid dependence. We have to make sure that uh, we are talking about um, additional financing and very serious leveraging of private sector financing. I was pleased to see that this is a priority uh, that given to climate finance by the French presidency of this year's uh, COP. Um, affordable, affordable solutions are in reach. They deploy both public and private finance effectively and fairly, and an honest approach to fi climate finance can be a transformative breakthrough on the road uh, to Paris. And we need to bear in mind that it's the poorest countries and communities that suffer disproportionately from climate change uh, disruptions and must be given priority in getting uh, green, uh, green energy. Thirdly and finally, we need to get finance ministers from all countries to understand both the SDG and the climate change processes. They usually understand the SDG and financing for development process because the financial matters involved naturally come to their attention. But the climate agenda is still too often seen as being the realm of environment ministers. That, of course, will change the closer we get to Addis in July um, and New York in September and then Paris in December. So the earlier we prepare for the involvement of finance ministers, the better. I believe this is essential to the trust needed for Paris. It's a wonderful year of opportunity. We just cannot miss it. But we need to make really good linkages, and I'm glad we're talking about this at this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I now request President Horta. Of the formerly the president, you can speak from here, sir, and former president of Timor and uh, a Nobel laureate, and may I request him for his views on this problem. May I say that I'm really grateful to pre President Horta. He has to be somewhere else, but he has, I prevailed upon him to stay here, so he will speak and he may have to leave, and uh, it is at my insistence that he is staying here. So it's, I'm responsible for this. <laughs> My uh, apologies. I'm here also in my capacity as chair of the UN uh, high-level panel on peace operation, which aiming at review, peacekeeping, and the special political missions. And I have an engagement with one of the most important troop contributing country to the UN peacekeeping, that is India. So I have to uh, subject myself to the schedule that was given to me by the Indian government. But my panel uh, colleagues, in particular uh, former Prime Minister 
Kevin Rudd, whom uh, we all know as a champion of uh, climate change. He was the one who uh, got Australia to ratify Kyoto and took uh, many innovative initiatives while uh, Prime Minister. He will also speak uh, for me. Uh, whatever he says, I will endorse. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, coming from a small, small country, although uh, not like Maldives, we are not uh, uh, under uh, uh, sea level. Uh, Timor-Leste goes from 500 meters to uh, 3,000 meters high. Uh, but uh, allow me to speak for the fragile states, for all the small island states, particularly concerning uh, overseas development assistance. I was in New York uh, in, 90, in 2009, soon after the world financial crisis, and I heard from every uh, develop, developed country, OECD countries, that there will be continuing commitment to uh, maintain the same levels of uh, development assistance to developing countries, and yet, Almost every single country, with the exception of the Nordic countries, European Union, uh, and the European Union, uh, have uh, decreased dramatically ODA. And I'm not speaking only uh, for my country, because uh, actually my country is a small oil and gas produ producing country, exporting country, and we are 100% self-sufficient in financing our uh, annual budget. But I speak for so many uh, that have uh, seen the promises made by uh, OECD countries betrayed, uh, with notable exception of, of, of course, the Nordic countries and the UK, United Kingdom. Uh, e even under conservative government of uh, Prime Minister Cameron, the only uh, G7, G8 country that has increased ODA to 0.7%, as always asked by the United Nations. So congratulations. Uh, commendation to uh, United Kingdom, but all the others have a decrease uh, overseas development assistance. We cannot dissociate uh, climate change discussions uh, from development assistance. We cannot dissociate sustainable development for increased uh, development assistance to uh, fragile states in particular. Uh, I end my, uh, my comments here, and uh, I actually have two uh, I already passed the time, actually. I, I thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid the, the clock there is misbehaving. I don't know what it is doing. <laughs> I have no idea what it is up to. But may I now request President Calderon, formerly President of Me uh, Mexico, and also one of the leaders of the climate and economy process. Thank you. Uh, what we are doing now with Nick Stern, Pro Lord Professor Nick Stern, another member like Paul Polman, you listened to him yesterday, and others, we integrated the global commissions on the economy and climate. And basically, what we are doing, could you put uh, the report in the screen? Yes, you are watching that. Well, basically, what we are trying to do, and actually I say we are doing, is to demonstrate that it is possible to tackle climate change and at the same time to promote economic growth. So for us, clearly, that is a false dilemma that we need to choose between one or another. We can do both, and we must do both, but the next 15 years will be crucial. So the main conclusion of the report we presented to the United Nations is, yes, it is possible to have better growth and better climate. It is possible to have economic growth and poverty alleviation at the same time to be responsible with the environment. But we need to act in the next 15 years, which is the last window of opportunity that we have to do that. Basically, the report emphasizes three, the change to three big systems, and I will go quickly over them. One is the energy system. So we, clearly we need to switch from a high carbon intensive economic growth to decarbonize <coughs> economic growth, and that is possible. I will talk a little bit about that. We need to change the system regarding land use in the sense that we need to produce, for instance, more food for more people with higher quality in the same or even less surface for agricultural purposes. And the, three, the third system we need to change is cities. We cannot afford this sprawling model of cities we have today, and we need to move toward more smart cities, as, Chinese, uh, as India's uh, program says, uh, which is connected 
compact and coordinated cities of the future. But the good news is we say that it is possible to have economic growth because we detect several drivers of economic growth that can even foster the performance of the economy. Some of those drivers are resource efficiency. We talk a lot about labor efficiency, talk a lot about capital efficiency or productivity. It's time to talk about natural resources efficiency. Just think about the water in India. The same case in Mexico. Whenever you can give with no cost water, you cannot get improvement in terms of competitiveness, for instance, for agricultural purposes. We need to change that and we can get economic growth for natural resources efficiency. Second driver, infrastructure investment. And basically the idea is this. We estimate in the commission that in the next 15 years, we need to invest one way or another. By any means, $90 trillion in, in infrastructure, either in energy, land uses, or cities. $90 trillion. Well, if we do that in this current inertial model of carbon, in, carbon intensive, we will invest that. But if we, if we switch towards low carbon path, we will invest roughly the same amount of money, $90 trillion. Actually, in some estimation, we can save money at net present value. So the idea is if we are going to invest such amount of money, do that in the right way, and that is possible. And finally, the last driver is innovation. If we can foster innovation, innovation is the most important uh, engine for economic growth since the men discovered the fire. So our report concludes that it is possible to have not only the same growth, but even better economic growth, being responsible with the environment. Now, quickly, the case applicated to, in, to India. Good news is we are going to present very soon the report, a special case for India. It was not possible to present in this summit, but very soon we will present this. Some of the conclusions, it's quite interesting, but for instance, talking about, about energy, the case of India. You can see that India is importing energy. It's getting into a huge deficit. The trade balance for fuels is more than 6% of GDP. That is not affordable, and that is not rational in the sense that India is running a very high risk in terms of security, importing more than 6% of, of fuels, and fossil fuels in particular, coal, for, to supply energy. It's more than twice the trade balance deficit of the country. Um, the point is, we are estimating that most of that is going to coal. But the good news is today, as you know very well, the price of renewable energy is going down dramatically. 80% lower the cost in solar and similar figures for wind energy. So those are good news that allow India and other countries to switch toward the new path economy. And the point in this is we can assure, and that will appear in the report, that by 2020, in the case of India, solar and wind power will be between 30 and 50% cheaper, 30% cheaper than imported coal by 2020. So it is rational for environment and it is rational for Indian's economy to move towards renewable energy. Now it's time to take such kind of decision. Cities. India has 15 out of the 30 cities most polluted in the world. It's painful to say that, but it's true. And it is time to change because these cities are implying an incredible damage to the health. And in it, those situa that situation is increasing the health cost for Indian government. We need to reduce or cancel that externality, and that is another reason to move toward renewable energy here and reduce the high pollution here in Delhi and other cities. Delhi, Padna, Grelor, Raipur, the four most polluted cities in the world in terms of the PM uh, air pollution index in the world. That implies, for instance, that India, you can see, is out of the path, is not according even with the, its level of income per capita, is the, the level of pollution of Indian cities is above the international random. I don't go into deep because uh, I'm running out of time. 
But I w the point is this, if, you, if we can estimate, and that is possible, the economic value, economic value of uh, the mortality or the people, uh, the estimated people who died in a premature way, the economic value for India is more than 6% of its GDP a year. Yes, it's lower than the case of China because more people live in China in, in cities, but in the case of India, it's really high. Or in other words, all the economic growth that this country is performing, it is not enough to offset the economic value of the people who is dying in a premature way do air pollution, only air pollution in outdoors. So we need, that is another economic reason to address the issue, is worth it. The price of carbon will, should be more than double than the current uh, price of carbon because it is not including those kinds of externalities. And finally, land use, I need to run on this. This is the estimation of uh, the income and the returns in agricultural GDP. And in, in the bottom, if we invest in research and development and infrastructure like roads or in education, we will increase the productivity of agricultural sector. However, we, the governments, invest much more in subsidies to fertilizers, to power subsidies, to credit subsidies that are not producing the necessary returns to improve the performance of the agricultural sector. So in brief, my friends, and that is the day of the report, yes, it is possible to have economic growth. Yes, it is possible to reduce poverty, and it is possible to create jobs, and at the same time, it is possible to tackle climate change and reduce the climate risk. But that requires very brave and courage decisions that we need to take in the next 15 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I now turn to President Kayum, uh, formerly president of the Maldives. I do not need to, he's a, a great friend of the summit and he has been here before. And I just wanted to mention one thing, that uh, he was the first head of state to raise the issue of climate change at the highest political level at the international system when he spoke on this at the Vancouver summit of the Common. Common, Commonwealth. And I never, uh, uh, hesitate to remind people that it was a developing country president who raised this issue first. And I think you were joined by President Arshad of Bangladesh also yes. in the same meeting who raised this issue. So let us recognize that and let me invite him to tell us how he sees the issue now. Thank you very Thank much. much. Thank you. Rahman Rahim, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable panelists. It is a pleasure to be invited again to speak at this gathering of great minds and bold ideas. I thank the chairman of Terry, Professor Pachori, for this opportunity. It was in 1992 in Rio that the nations of the world affirmed the principle that all human development must be sustainable. Two decades later, we are setting a new development agenda to be concluded later this year that will bring special focus to the concept of sustainable development and outline specific actions required to achieve it in all of its dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. We hope that this new agenda will complement the Millennium Development Goals framework in addressing all issues of sustainable development, including the vulnerability of countries to climate change and natural disasters. Indeed, two decades later, these issues of sustainability have become more pressing. The numerous and well-intended pledges to provide resources and to implement plans to address climate change while securing sustainable development remain largely unrealized. While we wait disappointed and undecided, we are witnessing a changing world that was neither foreseen nor anticipated when the MDG framework was drawn up. 
growing energy demands from a rapidly increasing global population, which is expected to reach 9 billion by 2050, will soon outpace our fossil fuel supplies. The worldwide addiction to fossil fuels is not only unsustainable, but it contributes significantly to climate change, which compromises our biodiversity, food, and water security. As the nations of the world gather this year to finalize the post-2015 negotiations, we must not hesitate to set a truly transformative development agenda that puts people at the center of sustainable development. The report of the Open Working Group on the Sustainable Development Goals provides a solid foundation for the new framework reflecting the common consensus of UN member states. Distinguished delegates, sustainable development cannot be achieved without addressing the scourge of climate change. The fundamental connection between sustainable development and climate change is reflected in the ultimate objective of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. The convention requires that, and I quote, such a level should be achieved within a time frame sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change, to ensure that food production is not threatened, and to enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner, end of quote. The Maldives is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change and its impact. This is amply demonstrated by the fact that our mean maximum temperature has gone up 0.6 degrees Celsius between 1975 and 2014, and that this has been the cause of a mean sea level rise of close to 60 millimeters over the past 20 years. This is a very serious matter for a country that barely rises 1.5 meters above mean sea level. We are in a very different situation to that of East Timor, where the president said that their country has very high ground, but we do not. Although certain countries and, and regions, such as the Maldives, are more vulnerable than others, climate change can only be confronted by humanity acting as a united global force. To do so, we must all embrace the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities to ensure the provision of financial, technological, and human resource support to the vulnerable countries like the Maldives. Climate change is a universal problem, and it requires an all-inclusive universal solution. However, this must not be merely in the form of good intentions and eloquent words, but must take the form of access to adequate financing, technology transfer, and capacity building without obstacles such as stifling rules and bureaucracy processes. The most vulnerable countries, particularly small island developing states, must quickly gain the necessary resources and assistance to combat climate change. We need to help, we need help to build economic and social development in a sustainable manner today because tomorrow may very well be too late. The IPCC and International Energy Agency warn that greenhouse gas emissions are now at an all-time high, with last year going on record as the hottest in human history. We have no time to lose. Our generation's actions on climate change and achieving sustainable development will determine, as never before, the legacy we pass on to our children. We are all in the same sinking boat. We must all work together to save our planet or we will all drown together. Thank you. I thank Pro President Primo for his eloquent speech for climate action. I now ask my request to Mr. Kevin Rudd, the formerly Prime Minister of Australia, and I remember the way he livened up the Bali uh, meeting when he made this speech announcing that Australia was coming on board. 
on climate action. So may I now request the Vice. Thank you very much, and it's great to be back here in India where I have visited many times before and where I'm pleased to have so many friends. And we've visited uh, Terry before, this great institution, as Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, and now as President of the Asia Society in New York. It reminds me that uh, Asia, this wonderfully diverse continent, home to so many of the high civilizations of our world, now has this great global responsibility bearing down on all of us in this great continent and around it because we represent now more than half the world's population. We increasingly represent something approaching half the world's gross domestic product. As a consequence, our responsibilities to the planet are great indeed. There's always a danger in conferences like this that we preach to the converted. I've been to a few meetings like that over the years. It's a bit like singing hymns from the same song sheet. Um, so um, my view on these things is very simple. The IPCC has spoken. Uh, the science is clear. Uh, that is, uh, climate change is caused by anthropogenic activity. That if we allow temperature increases to go beyond two degrees centigrade, then we run the risk of irreversible climate change. And therefore, global political leaders have a fiduciary duty to the planet and to the peoples of the planet and to the life forms of the planet to act to prevent that from occurring. We can complicate things too much. That's it. That's as simple as the message as to why we need to act must be. Uh, I often think that God, whoever she or he might be, uh, must be puzzled looking down on this small blue ball uh, called planet Earth and asking this question as to why the people of this small blue ball called planet Earth would want, wish to willingly uh, suffocate themselves into extinction or fry themselves into extinction over time. Um, we should be smarter than that. So I don't intend to preach to the converted. Uh, what I'd like to do instead is to provide three observations, which I would describe as lessons from Copenhagen for Paris. Uh, like many in this room, I am a survivor of Copenhagen. Um, many of us still bear the scar tissue of that engagement. Uh, some of us bore particularly deep political scar tissue from that engagement. But the bottom line is this, uh, we are people who should learn from our international and national experiences. So I offer three observations. Number one, when we look at one of the reasons uh, that uh, Copenhagen did not deliver the results that we needed, the causes were patently political. But let us look at the contrast points. Back then at Copenhagen, preparation was probably insufficient for that conference. For Paris, the preparation is more than sufficient. Number two, in Copenhagen, we had an exclusion effectively of civil society. Uh, our friends in France, uh, led by Laurent Fabius, the French foreign minister, has learned from that and civil society is included in our deliberations leading to Paris and will be so at Paris itself. Number three, back in the days of Copenhagen, the business community voice was at best divided and frankly, uh, often unhelpful. Five years later, that has changed and I pay tribute to business leaders who are with us today for being agents of that change. Uh, number four, uh, back then we still had a binary debate between climate change action and economic development. Five years later, the binary of that has frankly basically being resolved as action on climate change is now seen as integral to sustainable development and sustainable economic growth. These are big changes. But the biggest change of all, and why I emphasize these political factors, lies here in this room and in this city. Back at Copenhagen, India and China were effectively opposed to a global agreement. Now that is no longer the case. I would thank our Chinese friends for that. 
I would particularly here in Delhi like to thank our Indian friends for that. And I acknowledge publicly the leadership of Prime Minister Modi and his ministerial team for indicating publicly that they are behind the delivery of a global agreement by the time we reach Paris. So my first lesson from Copenhagen is politics. This time, the political factors are, I believe, working in our direction. That was not the case five years ago. Secondly, finance. And I emphasize here what Mary Robinson has had to say most cogently in this gathering here this morning. In Copenhagen, we had no effective preparation for the financial outcomes necessary. Uh, and as a consequence, the debates we then had on the Green Development Fund, as it was then uh, discussed, were at best uh, ill-considered, ill-prepared, and in the view of the developing world, inadequate. Five years later, and here is my warning, is that the debate on finance still remains unresolved. And we collectively are deluding ourselves if we think we can deliver a robust outcome in Paris in the absence of resolving finance for climate change, uh, at least by the middle of the year before Paris. And here is Mary Robinson's key point, and I emphasize it again. Finance for climate change action must be seen as, integrated as, and delivered as finance for sustainable development. This is one conceptual whole. It is not a separate activity. And two, I would emphasize this, that if you look carefully at global finance, Public finance through ODA is inadequate. It is shrinking at present. Secondly, you look at the available public finance available through the multilateral development banks. It too is not nearly adequate to the task. And thirdly, therefore, we must harness not just uh, additional ODA, we must not just harness additional uh, finance from the MDBs, but we must also harness new financial vehicles from the global financial community as well, which means that the projects in which we are engaged must be of sufficient financial merit to warrant the investment of private capital. After all, as Felipe Calderon has just reminded us, so much of the action on climate change lies in action effectively on investment in new infrastructure. And therefore, we must consider it as a object of both public and private finance combined with public provi finance providing the leverage necessary or the risk mitigation necessary for delivering larger quantums of private finance. My third and last point. Number one, politics now working against us. Two, finance unresolved, must be resolved by mid-year, <coughs> otherwise we run a real risk of things running right off the rails in the second half of the year. And thirdly, a comment about the future. Back in Copenhagen, we went to that meeting with the international community expecting that we would deliver a binding global agreement. That was the expectation. We did not deliver that. One of the compromises that was delivered both in Copenhagen and subsequently confirmed at Cancun through the leadership of Felipe Calderon was this. It was an Australian proposal for individual national declarations of action. And that's what we did. And it was intended to be a temporary exercise until such time as a binding global agreement came into being. But here is the problem. Five years later, these individual national declarations of action have become the norm, rather than a binding global agreement on us all uh, towards a particular endpoint. As a consequence, here is the lesson from Copenhagen for the future. If we're going to proceed on the basis of individual national action declarations as the activating mechanism for what we agree on in Paris, we therefore must build into the Paris Agreement a mandatory regular review process both of our respective national commitments and of our delivery against those commitments against the, glo the global targets we set for ourselves. Other than that, we produce a piece of paper flapping in the wind. Other than that, we run the real risk of creating some sort of Potemkin village on climate change. So to conclude, I congratulate uh, my co-panelists on their core presentations this morning and the stark reminder from those representing small island developing states such as the Maldives and such as Timor-Leste 
and the 42 to 46 states in the United Nations family for whom this is often an existential Sorry. question. Um, I'd also congratulate the French government for their excellent preparations to date. But I conclude with the government of India, our hosts here today, and simply say what a delight it is for me as a former Prime Minister of Australia to hear Indian government ministers stand up here today and speak in favour of a global agreement uh, at, uh, at Paris. Perhaps when I look at India and Australia, we often celebrate the fact that we are united by three big Cs, a common language, the Commonwealth, and our common passion for a game called cricket, in which we have had our ups and downs over the years. <laughs> Australia and India, that is. And I won't comment, my Indian friends, on recent developments. Well, we're not limiting you. That's the but I could say this. <laughs> Let's add a fourth C, common action on climate yeah, change. And unlike cricket, where it's up and down, <laughs> and it's a bit been a bit like that over the last five years in terms of concerted international action on climate change, on climate change, yeah. rather than two teams playing yeah, against each other, the world needs to unite as a single team to deliver a win for the planet and its peoples. Thank you. We are exhausting the time that is available to us for the session, but I uh, just wanted to, uh, the, the sense of the panel, one, is the importance of the political processes leading up to uh, uh, Paris. They seem to be far more robust this time than they were five, uh, ten years ago. Second, the importance of linking the Paris agenda with what is happening on the Sustainable Development Goals. Third, a very clear plea from President Calderon particularly, that really what we are talking of when we speak of action on climate is these days more positive for growth and development. In fact, it may be the main opportunity for innovation and growth in this century. Uh, and uh, also the change that you see in the corporate mindset on this reflects this. And uh, President Kayyum's uh, very strong plea for putting some real action behind the past statements which have been made and the way in which he and the President Horta brought out the existential questions which confront certain countries. For them, it's not simply a matter of this or that. It's either this or the end, you know? So that's a little different type of uh, uh, balancing that has to be uh, done. And I think basically I thank uh, you know, uh, Mr. Raj for his kind remarks about the Indian uh, uh, minister's statements. And let us hope that all of this really comes together in, in Paris. I think the most important change that I see is that today, frankly, the energy alternatives are making sound economic sense. And quite frankly, I believe that even if we don't get an agreement, sheer economics is going to help us along the way, as you can see in the very ambitious targets which India has announced for solar development, 100 gigawatts, which is a huge number as far as India is concerned, since we're only at about two gigawatts now. So I'm afraid I don't really have time to uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, but we will be there, the speakers will all be there in the coffee, you can buttonhole them and question them. And in any case, our purpose was to set the scene for the theme of this session, from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. So let us hope that the New York-based processes on Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris-oriented processes on climate change come together so that climate change is seen as an important way of realizing, the, the action on climate change is seen as an important way of realizing the sustainable development goals. The core benefits dimension comes out more clearly of energy security, energy uh, access, uh, and frankly, even the profitability of energy companies is going to be affected by all this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Uh, and before we break for coffee, I think I owe you all an explanation about who I am. Maybe some of you who watched me on air for more than 20 years on CNN International are wondering, what am I doing here? Well, I'm wondering this myself. I wanted to let you know that uh, after more than 20 years with CNN, I left in December because I want to dedicate my communication skills to a big cause. So I looked around, and I couldn't find a bigger cause than sustainable development. And so here I am. 
thanks to Dr. Bachari. <laughs> And uh, I, uh, as I said, I am really thrilled to be among all of you, people who care so passionately about this, uh, the biggest issue of our time, which happens to be also the most difficult issue, but no road worth traveling uh, is easy. So uh, I really admire you and respect you for traveling that road, and I hope I can help with my communication skills, take the message to the people whose cooperation you really need uh, to travel that road and, and make things happen, learning from the past, as our panel told us, what the lessons of the past are, and, and using what has changed, uh, as Mr. Rudd was saying, a lot has changed uh, in favor of this road, and, and really build a solid foundation for the future of sustainable development. So let's have some tea now, and I'll see you again at noon, when we will hear from Nobel laureates what they have to say about this difficult road ahead, but so worth traveling. See you back at noon. <laughs>